relationship we, with you in the first place uh, is all your work. It's all your, it's all your doing, Lord, and for that we praise you and honor you and pray that you'd be glorified this day in Yeshua's name. Amen. Um, as, I, as I've been saying, uh, RCC, Restored Covenant Community, is entering into its fifth year. And as I've been kind of prayerfully evaluating where, where, we at, where we're at, where, what we've been a part of, where we're going, you know, I just think back over the last four years, and I think, really, you know, there's a lot that we've done. You know, there's ministries that we're supporting outside of this congregation. There's things going on within the congregation of supporting each other and growing in the faith. A lot of good things. And so, not to diminish any of those, I've just been thinking, Lord, but what, what do you want us to do that brings us even closer to what you're calling a congregation to be, to be a part of and, and that defines a congregation. And though I will not say that it totally is lacking, I would say that I believe that we need to make and to have a greater focus on evangelism within this congregation. And uh, that's what, it's an interesting thing because typically when you say evangelism, you're talking about reaching out to the lost. What do I do with my water? Uh, you're talking about reaching out to the lost, and I'm talking about that too. And, I, and I'm, I'm certainly including that. But we have the unique ministry that believe, I believe God has given us of not only reaching out to the lost, but to reaching out to the church, to our brothers and sisters in the faith. Not so much with the gospel of salvation, but with the full message of the Great Commission. And, uh, and I believe that that makes that part of our great, part of the Great Commission that we have to engage in. And I believe that if we can see where we're at currently, that that actually will encourage us, help us, if we can see where we're at in God's history of this work of restoration. And it's kind of interesting because where we're at in the history of God's work of restoration, I believe is where we're at in God's yearly calendar. Okay? The Passover season's over. The fall feasts have not come. So we're in this in-between stage, what's called working in the field. It's called laboring in the field. Well, that's kind of where we're at right now in the history of of God's work of restoration. We're, in, we're, we're between those two camps, those two holidays. The, fall, the spring feasts, which were fully fulfilled at the first coming. The fall feasts, which haven't been fulfilled, and we're somewhere there in the middle. I don't believe that we're sitting dead center, though. I believe we're far down that road toward the fall feasts. But having an idea of where we're at, I believe, can encourage us, get us more excited about the Great Commission. I talked pretty extensively last week about the Great Commission, and I want to talk just a little bit here about it again, just to kind of refresh. I'm not going to go so in-depth with it as I did last week. But um, I believe that this time of working in the field, laboring in the field, that's a prophetic reference to what we call the Great Commission. That's what it's talked about. And we've been talking about this Great Commission and the idea of reading, really reading what we call the Great Commission, because you hear the church, the mainstream church, talk a lot about the Great Commission, which they will say is, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as I had said, typically, that's it. I mean, that's the, that's the focus, and that's good. I mean, that's, that's the focus of reaching out to the lost. But that is not the completion of the Great Commission. It goes on to say, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In other words, folks, not to sound crude, but this Great Commission is not calling us to just go get people saved. 
Just get them saved, man. That's what I've heard that people say. Just get them saved. We, yeah, but what about their life? After, uh, just get them saved, and then they're out of here. Well, that's not what the Great Commission is. The Great Commission is, is making disciples, baptizing them, and then teaching them. Now, we looked at this a little bit, and I wanted to just dissect this very quickly here as we look at this. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to his disciples before he ascends. He tells them, go therefore and make disciples of all the Gentiles. Israel's included in that, but that is a reference to Gentiles. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them, who's them? The Gentiles. Can include Israel, but it includes, for the most part, Gentiles. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Who's you? Well, specifically Israel. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So when we talk about the Great Commission, a lot of times the Great Commission really isn't looked at for what the Great Commission is. But I want to look at something here that I believe can give us even more clarity to the importance of where we're at today in God's work of restoration. And what I'm referring to is found in these two historical events. The Babylonian captivity and the return to exiles is a prophetic parallel to the Dark Age and the Reformation. Okay, and so today I want to kind of begin looking at these parallels of this whole situation here. Uh, the Babylonian captivity is when Judah went into Babylon for 70 years and then returned. Some of them returned. And then talking about and paralleling that with the Dark Age and then the work of the Reformation movement. Now, this work of restoration after the Babylonian captivity, which primarily is found in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they come in three waves. Okay, this work of restoration came in three waves. The first wave came by a man, led by a man named Zerubbabel. His name means born in Babylon, because Zerubbabel was born in Babylon, I guess, and he leads the first wave of of restoration. He leads the first waves of exile to leave Babylon to go back and rebuild the city. He relays, well, he has the altar built for sacrifices, but he relays the foundation. There's a time frame there we'll talk about in just a little bit. And then he, the house is built. The temple is finished. Okay. The reformers, to parallel this, the reformers, specifically Martin Luther, relay the foundation of faith and begin the, the, the building of the house with living stones. Okay? Now the second wave comes in about 80 years later. And that's led by a man named Ezra. Now Ezra goes back and restores the law to the people. Teaches them how to do it and to, and to obey God's laws. Parallel that, I believe, with the Messianic movement today, where we are basically reintroducing God's laws to God's people. And then the, first, the third and final wave of restoration came under a man named Nehemiah. That would happen about 13 years later, after Ezra. And there was a time when Ezra and Nehemiah kind of worked together there, too. But under Nehemiah, the physical boundaries were restored. Parallel that with the millennial king and his kingdom, where the physical boundaries will be restored. Okay, those are the parallels that I want to go on over the next few weeks. And uh, so today I want to look at the first of these three waves and parallel those with the Dark Ages and the Great Reformation. You see, Here's what I believe that kind of catches people off sometimes, hopefully not you, and that is this. 
I don't believe the Reformation is finished. I don't believe that the Reformation that happened in the 1500s under Martin Luther, later some of the other reformers who would come, was a finished product. I don't believe that they brought to completion all that God wanted restored. But I do believe, here's where it gets a little tough, I do believe that they were faithful to what they understood God had called them to. So I look at the reformers as godly men who served God and fulfilled the role that they were called. Did they go on to establish Torah? No, they did not. Did they go on to set the final boundaries? They could not. Israel wouldn't even exist at that point. The, the, the thing I want to point to here is, this is a work of restoration. How many of you want it all done right now? I mean, you want everybody that you talk to to believe what you're ta trying to tell them about the Torah. I do, but you know what? As much as I try to make that happen, and sometimes in the past, I've tried to really make it happen. Sometimes almost forcefully. It doesn't, does it? And there's a reason. There's a reason, and I'll get to that in just a few seconds here. But just to give you a little bit of a taste of it, because it's God's work. It's not Art Cox's work. And it's not your work. It's God's work. So it's God's timing. Okay? Um, I want to draw out of these two things here. This Babylonian captivity, returning of the exiles, Dark Age, Reformation. I want to draw out of that and share with you what I believe is the purpose, vision, and goals that God has for this congregation. So I want to start with backing up just to lay just a little bit of groundwork. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I want to because it's important for the parallel that we're going to look at in a little bit. The undivided, divided kingdom of Israel. Under King David, the kingdom of Israel was united. All 12 tribes were there. All 12 tribes were united under the king, under King David, what at least would ultimately be under him for most of his, his reign. And then he passes that on to his son, King Solomon. While King Solomon is alive, the 12 tribes are still unified together. There's trouble brewing. There's, there, there's not a consensus about everybody being on the same page, there's some things going on, there's some attitudes among different tribes rising up, but they're still united, okay? When, Je when, uh, Re when uh, uh, Solomon dies, Rehoboam, his son, takes over, okay? You got the ten kingdoms, the ten northern kingdoms. They approach uh, Rehoboam and they say, look, your father was hard on us. If you'll lighten up, we will serve you and everything will stay fine. But if you don't, we're out of here, dude. And so what does Solomon or what does Rehoboam tell them? Because he listens to his young buddies. And he tells them, well, forget it, I'm going to be rougher than my dad. And they said, we're out of here. And the kingdom splits. We have what's called the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom. And then the southern kingdom, which was Benjamin and Judah. And that was, that was when the kingdom split. Okay. And... Uh, when the kingdom split, Israel, the northern kingdom, it wouldn't be a long time after that because Jeroboam, their king, took them into idolatry immediately. And it just went down from there. The northern kingdom didn't have one good king. When you read about the kings in the Bible, northern kingdom, not one, not one king that was good. And so it was conquered by Assyria. They took the people out. They scattered them abroad, as the Lord told through Hosea was going to happen. And we're going to scatter them like seed. And then Assyria comes and brings other people from other countries that they've conquered and brings them into the land of Israel. That's what would become known as the Samaritans of Jesus' day. People who were knowledgeable about the things of God, but they were still really pagans. And then you had the southern kingdom of Judah that did not learn from the sins of the northern kingdom. 
and they started to be into idolatry. So on the streets of Jerusalem, you have Jeremiah the prophet preaching, repent and come back to the Lord. While he's preaching on the streets of Jerusalem, you have another guy preaching in Babylon named uh, Ezekiel. And Ezekiel's preaching in Babylon, saying to those who already been exi exiled, because that also came in a few waves, Nebuchadnezzar comes, he attacks Jerusalem, takes some of the people back to Babylon, but everything still functions in Jerusalem. Okay, that happened in a couple of waves until finally he just destroys it and takes all that are alive back to Babylon with him. Well, before that happens, Ezekiel's in Babylon saying to the people, look, you need to repent and you're not going home right away. So we need to just bear down and live it out here because we're here till the Lord's chastisement's over. Okay, that's what's going on there. And I promise all this matters, okay? And from the book of Daniel, we know that the Jews that were in Babylon, those first exiles, and then even the second exiles, they were challenged about keeping the dietary laws, bowing down to idols. They didn't want to bow down to idols, but they were forced to. They were bowing down to idols in Judah. God says, you bow down to idols in Babylon. You wanted to, so, uh, you wanted to serve false gods? You're going to serve false gods. And prohibitions against prayer. We see all these things in the book of Daniel. Finally, the 70 years is fulfilled. Babylonian captivity, and then finally, these 70 years is fulfilled. Now, when you uh, look at the 70 years, people a lot of times they'll say, well, look, uh, Babylon came in, destroyed the temple in 586 B.C., and then the return starts in 538. There's only 48 years. If you've ever asked yourself why that is, is because the 70 years in Babylon starts with those very first exiles that left. Okay, the very first run of exiles. So, Babylon starts to come to an end. The writing is on the wall, right? We've all heard that phrase. The writing's on the wall. It's over, man. Well, that's basically what happened here. Uh, Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, is having a big party. And while he's got his guys in there, he has some of the cups from the, te the temple brought in that his father had taken, and he starts to use those in the party, in the, in the celebration, the banquet, and so forth. And then all of a sudden, a hand comes out of nowhere and starts writing on the wall. Well, everybody freaks out. I would freak out, wouldn't you? I mean, and, but nobody understood what it meant, so he called in all the wise guys and all that, and they all go, we all know what it means. And then somebody says, there's an exile from, Bat, from uh, Judah. And they brought Daniel in. And Daniel read to them, to him, what it meant. He said to Daniel, if you will, give, if you will tell me the interpretation is, I'll give you gold and I'll give you high power and all this. And it's kind of interesting because Daniel says, keep your gifts. But I'm going to go ahead and tell you what you got. Basically, keep your gifts because they're not really yours to give because this message is getting ready to come true and you're not going to be in a position to give me anything. What's it say? It says, meany, meany, tekel, you farson. That's what Daniel says it says. Now, if that would have been all he said, still nobody would have understood what he meant. But he didn't. He gave the interpretation. He says, God has numbered the days of your kingdom. He's talking to the king of Babylon. You're weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Okay? That night, that very night, the Medes and the Persians conquer Babylon. Belshazzar is killed. And now we have Medes and Persians ruling over Babylon. And Bob Babylon falls. Cyrus, the first king, gives the order to restore the temple and the faith. Why? Because the 70 years is over. 
God said through Jeremiah, 70 years is going to be the time frame by which you're going to spend in Babylon. Anybody know why he came up with 70 years? Because it's a long time? Why? Yeah, John? That's right. Amen. That's right. That's exactly what's going on. The Shemitah years, you know, they weren't keeping them. The land wasn't laying at rest. So God says, hmm, let me add these up. Okay, this all comes up to 70 years that the land has not rested. Huh. Well, that's how long you're going to Babylon. So the 70 years was over, the land laid at rest, and the 70 years was up, and so it was time to go back. Well, God raised up the Medes and the Persians to conquer Babylon because it's time for the exiles to go back. Isn't it amazing how God is? He'll overthrow huge kingdoms to bring about the will of his people and to bring about the plan of his people. See, he's got it all figured out. Every, everything's in his hands. Of, he'll overthrow kingdoms to bring back people. He'll, he'll bring a famine on the whole world to reunite a family back together again. You know, Jacob and his 12 sons, because Joseph's somewhere else. I mean, God is going to do whatever he does, and sometimes he'll shake the earth if he has to, to bring about the will and the good of his people. And so it's time to go back to Babylon. So he brings in this, this kingdom, the Medes and the Persians, to overthrow Babylon. And Cyrus says, because he puts forth a proclamation, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the world so that I can order that a house be built for him in Jerusalem. Now all you exiles who, Bab who Nebuchadnezzar brought out of there, you're free to go. Free to go. Go on back to your land and go. Everybody leaves, right? I mean, who wouldn't leave? Everybody would leave, right? Turn with me, please, to Ezra, chapter 1. And beginning at verse 1, it says this, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, first year that he took over Babylon, that the word of the Lord came by the mouth of pro the prophet Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing saying this, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given to me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left of any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all those spirits God had moved, arose and went to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and of gold and with goods and with livestock and with precious things, besides all of the willing was willingly offered. Okay, so uh, Cyrus says, look, if you want to go up, go up. And we're even going to pay the expenses. So if you want to go, go. Who went? Says, those whose heart God stirred. Of the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, the priests, Levites, and we don't know that it meant all of these guys, Leaders, leaders were called to go back. And everyone whose heart God stirred. So in other words, leaders and the common people collectively grouped together and went. And it sounds like this 
might have been a lot of people, right? It wasn't. It was less than 50,000. In Ezra chapter 2, verses 64 and 65 tell us the exact number. It's, a, it's under 50,000 people. We don't know how many is there in Babylon. A whole lot. And I don't know for a fact that every single ver person, even those who were serving Cyrus, were able to go at that moment. But most of them were able to if they chose to do it. And yet, under 50,000 go. Why? Why did most of them stay? Well, Babylon was their home. It's all they'd ever known. It's where some of them were born. It was familiar. It was comfortable. Babylon and then Persia that took over it was the place to be, man. I mean, it was, it was the uh, 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 rich and popular place to be. I mean, it was the headquarters of the world empire, basically, at that time. And they're offered to go back, but go back to what? I mean, those last exiles that came into Babylon said, hey guys, there ain't nothing left. They tore down the temple and burned it broke down the walls, the houses, the city. It's leveled. There's nothing there but a bunch of rubble and ashes. You really want to go back there? I mean, we already got jobs here. And our families here and our friends. But then there were those who did go. And what was in them that caused them to say, this is Babylon, yeah, all the glory and the comforts and the air conditioning and all of this type of stuff. Why would I want to go back to that broken, burnt place? Because that's where my God's name is. And I want to be with him and I want to be a part of his restoration. This is what we've been waiting for. And it says, God stirred their hearts. Which tells me that those who didn't go didn't get stirred. But some of those who stayed would go later. They would go in the second wave. Now, we can condemn them for not going in that first wave if we want to. But I don't know that it's just. Because it was God's timing about how and how this restoration was going to happen. And then there would even be a third wave after Ezra of ne Nehemiah. Why weren't all the people already there? Because in the days of Ezra, in the days of Nehemiah, God stirred again. That's where we're at today, folks. That's where we're at today. That's why we can't be quite so critical of our Christian brothers and sisters when we explain to them this messianic stuff and they go, I don't understand. It's not because they're stupid. And it's not because we're smarter than they are that we received it. It's what happened, guys. God stirred something in. That's right. That's right. God stirred something in you. I don't know where you were. Maybe you were sitting in a Sunday church and the preacher's talking and he's given a good solid message in most situations. But then he says something and you go, no. And something's stirring you in there and you say, Something's not right here. I, uh, he's a good man, but something is not. And then somebody comes up to you and says, well, I worship on Saturday because God never intended for the laws to be done. And all of a sudden, whoa. I mean, then you're stirred. and that, that, That's God. Okay, that's God. That's what happens. It's not because we go, you know, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and uh, it just doesn't quite add up in my mental thoughts. I just... That's not what happens. That's not how somebody initially comes to faith either, is it? Because initially when someone comes to faith, what happened in them? 
Holy Spirit made them aware, right? Woke them up to the spiritual realities. They sought out those spiritual realities and came to the understanding that God sent his son to die for our sins. If without the Holy Spirit working, that person would just stay where they are, right? I mean, we can all testify to that, correct? It's the same in this situation. It's the redemptive work, the work of restoration that God is doing. They get back and they rebuild the altar and they start offering sacrifices. Shortly after that, let's read Ezra chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. And when the seventh month had come, the children of Israel were in the cities, and the people gathered together as one man in Jerusalem. And Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of God, the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar in its bases and they offered burnt offerings to the Lord, both the morning and the evening offerings. So they started the sacrifice. In other words, folks, they didn't need a temple to offer sacrifices. The sacrifices were done on the altar that would be outside the temple and would remain outside the temple. Not having a temple did not stop the sacrifices from being, all, from being offered. Israel may put that connection together one day, that they don't have to have a temple for those offerings to start. But this was what they called to do, build the house of the Lord. So let's please turn to Ezra chapter 3 and look at verse 8. Now, in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God in Jerusalem, I got the power now, don't I? <laughs> then all the people shouted, I can lower my voice a little bit, people shouted with a great shout, then they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Amen, right? They get the, they get the foundation of the house of the Lord laid, everybody's shouting, everybody's exciting, they're having a big party. And it's time to build the house right and get to work right now and finish this baby up. But that's not what happened. The work stopped for about 15 years. Because some troublemakers had stirred up something. They sent a letter back to now Darius and said, uh, if these Jews build this, they're going to they're gonna cause problems. He said, stop the work. So they stopped the work for 15 years. And in that 15 years, those who would return started building their own houses, started living their lives, started just kind of going about their way. And then God had to send a different, a, a, another stirring to finish the work. He rose up the prophets Haggai and Zechariah and said, what are you doing? You came here to finish the house, finish the house. And it says, and the Spirit of the Lord stirred up the people to finish the house. So there's another stirring, that initial to get them there, the another stirring to finish the project. Now I want to parallel all of this with the Dark Ages and the Reformation movement. And I'll be, I should be able to move a little bit quicker this time. So I'm going to back up here. And use these same highlights. United Kingdom, divided kingdom. Before the Dark Age, you guys remember the 12 tribes were united? I'm sorry. You guys remember back in the first one that I talked about, the 12 tribes are united. 
They're not necessarily in agreement on everything, but they're united. Well, in the first century, before the Dark Age, we see this in the book of Acts. We see united Jews, and we see a united kingdom, so to speak. In other words, we see believing Jews, and we see unbelieving Jews in the same synagogues together. Jesus wasn't the problem that he would become later. We know that in Acts 17. They, they, they gratefully listened to Paul tell them about the Lord in their synagogue. Okay, later that would become more of a problem as that division came, but it wasn't then. They were in the synagogues together and there were even Gentile believers in the synagogues with them. So kind of a united camp, if you will. But then the divide starts. And that begins this way. More and more Gentiles are coming into the faith. More and more apprehension from the unbelieving Jews about these Gentiles coming into the faith. They're starting to fill these rooms up. What are we going to do here? I mean, ooh, okay. And that starts to create a little bit of tension. That starts to begin a little bit of a process of, of separating. But a big event happens that makes a major separation. That is, in 70 AD, the temple's destroyed. The physical temple is destroyed again. Well, here's what happened. What did our Lord do before his crucifixion and, resur and, and resurrection and ascension? What did he do? He warned his followers, right, that, that Jerusalem was going to be surrounded. And he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, get out. Flee to the mountains. Okay? So that's exactly what happened. The Romans under Titus surround Jerusalem. Well, how are the people getting out? They already surrounded Jerusalem. Well, they surround Jerusalem, and then, I don't know if it's just a flex of muscle or whatever, Titus pulls away, pulls the Roman army away. The believers in Jerusalem say, this is it, this is our door, let's get out of here. They flee. Titus comes back and destroys the city, destroys Jerusalem. That was a big split because the believers knew and they got out. The unbelievers stayed. Many of them were killed. Some, some recorded around a million. That was a big split. But the biggest split happened yet later in the future, but not real far. It happened with what we call the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. About 132 A.D., Rabbi Akiva hails this Bar Kokhba to be the Messiah. Now, the believers at this time are going to have no part of that, right? They're going to say, uh, no, Bar Kokhba is not the Messiah. Our Lord Yeshua is the Messiah. So there's a big split there. But Bar Kokhba nonetheless is able to get a pretty good following to stage a rebellion against Rome. That rebellion didn't work out too well. It was absolutely crushed. Jerusalem was trod under. No one was allowed to go there and thus start that time frame of, of this total separation. That's at the time frame. I don't want to get into this too much, but that's the time frame of when our calendar as we know it came into existence and why it came into existence. The Jewish people said, what are we going to do? If we're dispersed, we're going to lose all of this stuff. We, we know we keep the new moons at this time and the cycles of the feast work in this time. So they put it on paper. They made it into a calendar, a calendar that cycles because they said until there's an establishment of those who are going to have the authority to make the decisions when these are, we're going to have a calendar to show the people. Well, folks, I'm a strong advocate. Uh, I am a strong uh, supporter of the Jewish calendar, the traditional Jewish calendar for this one reason. Because we still do not have that authority set in place that they had at that time to determine the cycle of these things. Now, again, I realize today we have a thing saying when the new moon is and when all this stuff starts, all we got to do is look on our, on our computers. Or we have some of these people who are in Israel now who and they say this is when it is and we should listen to them. 
The reason the calendar was put into place is so that this stuff would not be lost. Well, until it's reestablished where these decisions can be made with authority, what do we use? And I'll tell you, typically the Messianic movement uses all kinds of stuff. And we come up with all kinds of different dates. And rather than being unified, we got people keeping new moon this time. We got people keeping new moon a few days later. We got people keeping Passover this month. And then people, of course, if you get, don't have the same month at Passover in the spring, you're not going to have tabernacles together. And it has created all kinds of things. I'm not saying I have the answer. I'm saying this is why the calendar exists. So that it wouldn't be lost. And for almost 2,000 years, everybody was okay with that. You know, 25 years ago when I was a Messianic, we didn't have these fights in the Messianic movement about when Passover is because everybody looked at the calendar and say, this is when Passover is. It wasn't until later on that everybody says, you know, we shouldn't be listening to these Jews. We should be finding out when is the Passover. Well, I don't think that there's enough there to make that kind of a decision. Who's, whose authority makes that decision? Again, I don't want to get into it real heavy. I just wanted to throw that out for you. If you disagree with me on that, that's okay. Don't let that fight, don't let that separate us from the things that we agree about the most, which is what the calendar's pointing to. Okay, so that's just on a, if that made you feel a little uncomfortable, well, save your tomatoes for later. I'll take them. But that is why the calendar was put into effect. Okay. So there was not this division. This division uh, came about over time, and believers and unbelieving Jews, basically there was a split. And unbelieving Jews and believing Jews became farther and farther apart. And then out of this group, the believing Jews and the believing Gentiles, they began to split. So now you had like three, three things going on here. And that basically carried on through what we call the Dark Ages. More and more of the Hebraic roots of our faith fell to the wayside. The unbelieving Jews held staunchly to their Judaism. And here's where a lot of people just don't like me very much in my putting forth of the way things go is, is this. Basically, it ended up into two different camps. The the unbelieving Jews, and what I call the Israel of God, made up of Jews and Gentiles who believe in Yeshua. Okay? So these are the two paths that we're going. We know what happened to Christianity, right? Not long out of the first century, we know what happened, right? Everybody here know what happened? It began to take on pagan elements. It began to take on things that were not of the roots of our faith. In fact, those things fell away very quickly, and other things were introduced, and the Faith was basically transformed into something that doesn't even, in a lot of ways, even kind of uh, uh, go with the Bible, right? Everybody okay with me on that? Now, here's one that you may not like too much. That exact same thing happened to this group over here. The unbelieving Jews came out of the first century, and as they went through the Dark Ages, they also lost a lot of where they were going, a lot of spiritualism came into Judaism. A lot of all kinds of goofy things came in there. They started to really buckle down on what we call the Talmud rather than the scriptures themselves. And Judaism morphed into something that today I don't think resembles a lot from the first century. Again, throw tomatoes, throw them a little later on. Don't want the camera to see it. But both sides lost their way. So what's God doing? He's bringing both of these that were in error back together again. He's starting to do that, bring them back together again. Why? Why is that? Because he's bringing this captivity to an end. Okay, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, Constantine merges the church and the state together and I believe that that's officially when we go into Babylonian captivity, spiritually speaking. The church enters the Dark Age. Now, the Dark Age is labeled as 
from 500 AD to 1000 AD. Then from 1000 AD to 1500 AD, they call that the Renaissance period, the Age of Enlightenment. But the merging of church and state, which was basically what birthed the Catholic Church, happened in 325 AD. And spiritually speaking, I call this whole time frame from 325 to 15 AD, a little over a thousand year period, I call that the Dark Age. And I do that because for all practical ways and for all practical reasons, the salvation message was lost. It became a salvation through indulgences. It became a salvation of works and so forth. And that's not the, that's not the message of salvation. But there was a remnant. Throughout the Dark Ages, there was a remnant. And during this time, the remnant would continue to be challenged about the same thing the exiles were challenged in Babylon. Challenged about keeping the Sabbath and the dietary laws and the feast days and bowing down to idols and prohibitions against prayer. The faith was transformed far from the first century. But the writing was on the wall and it was going to bring Babylon to an end, just as it brought physical Babylon, the captivity to an end, spiritual Babylon would lose its grip also. Belshazzar saw the writing on the wall, right? The Lord said, you're done, dude. You are finished. Well, at the end of the Dark Age, during what we call the Age of Enlightenment, God rose up a man named Martin Luther. And Martin Luther, he began to question some things. And he put together 95 concerns. We call them theses. He put together 95 concerns that he had for the Catholic Church. His not, it was not his intention to leave the Catholic Church. In fact, he never did officially leave the Catholic Church. It was his desire to reform the Catholic Church. Hence, reformer. Right? And he writes down his 95 concerns. He had no idea of what was about to happen, except that his, his thought was is that if he could just get some things stirred up here, get some questions answered, and maybe get back on the right track again. What instead happened was revolutionary. It began what we call the Reformation movement, and it would actually bring down spiritual Babylon. Why is that? Because just as the handwriting was on the wall to show Belshazzar his kingdom's done, it's, it's over. The grip on his people is finished. Martin Luther nails these 95 theses on October 31st, 1517, on a door of a church in Wittenberg, Germany. And spiritual Babylon begins to lose its hold on its people, on God's people. Begins to lose its grip. As time went on, more reformers would follow. William Tyndale, John Calvin, John Knox. Cyrus gives the order to restore the temple and the faith. Cyrus, Isaiah in chapter 45 calls Cyrus the anointed one, the one whom God anointed to bring these things about. The name Cyrus, if you look it up, it will say Koresh. You guys all remember that, that goofy dude from the Branch Davidian, David Koresh? That's where he got that name because he was pretending to be the anointed one, Koresh. But the real anointed one, Yeshua, gives the order and the Reformation movement begins to restore the house, to restore the faith, restore the things that were lost. Now here's where I want to make a connection with our Protestant brothers and sisters. Protestants are not in Babylon, folks. Now, Again, here, brace yourself, because sometimes this isn't what Messianics like to hear. But I believe to, to 
do the kind of great commission that we're called to do. We've got to get past this. Just hear me out. The Catholic Church is not Babylon per se. Babylon is all false religious systems. The Catholic Church is part of Babylon. And Protestants aren't in Babylon. They've left Babylon. Now, did they carry some of Babylon's ways out with them? Yes, they have, just like we did. And just like the exiles, when we look at next week, the exiles who left Babylon and went back to Jerusalem to rebuild that first wave under Zerubbabel, they brought back Babylonian ways with them. They brought back some of the influences of Babylon with them. They weren't perfect. God stirred them to go back and to do that, but they brought some ways. Remember when they were in the wilderness, they brought some of Egypt out of them with them, didn't they? Same thing with the exiles who went back to Babylon. Same thing with Protestants today, folks. We came out of Babylon, an aspect of Babylon, and in many ways, those who came out brought some of Babylon with them. Martin Luther never, he never tried to get from Sunday back to Saturday again. He had contemporaries, he had friends who did, said, hey look, if we're going to go by the scripture, we need to restore Sabbath on Saturday. He goes, no. And he didn't restore the feast days. And he didn't restore, you know, dietary laws and all of these types of things that we're in the midst of restoring now. He didn't, nor did those who followed him. Just like many uh, preachers in the Protestant churches today. They're not in the desire to restore these things. And it's our job to show them. That, that's our job to do that. You know, we need to view our Protestant brothers and sisters as being ripped off. You know, they don't understand the full call and com to complete the Reformation and the Restoration. That's the disconnect. They think they have fulfilled it all. They came out of the... Ca See, we don't, we don't really understand the term today, Protestant. You know where Protestant comes from? Protestant. Those who protested the Catholic Church. Today you have Protestants who will say, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a brother of the Lord and, and my Catholic friend here, he's a brother of the Lord too. And, and they endorse Catholicism. The, the, the first Protestants did not. That's why they're called protesters, protestants, Protestants. But they thought they were completing, completing all of what God had for them to restore. But they were not. And we haven't yet completed it all either. You know, we'll be best witnesses if we're patient and by not labeling them and calling them pagans. You know, remember Zerubbabel's day. It was all those who God stirred. Not just those who initially came, but those who finished the temple 15 years later. There had to be a re-stirring. In other words, those who initially came out of Babylon had to be stirred again to finish the work. And that's what we need today in the church today. We need another Holy Spirit stirring from God. That's what we need. We need God to raise up prophets like, like Haggai and Zechariah to say, finish the work. And we need a messianic movement that moves. Amen? Amen. I'm wrapping up quick, guys. The altars rebuilt. The reformers restored the spiritual altar. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And they relayed the foundation. Just like the exiles relayed the foundation, so did the reformers. They restored faith alone in Jesus Christ and the truth that he alone is the foundation by which we should build on. Turn with me please to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and I'm wrapping up real quick here folks. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 
verse 10 and 11. According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know, where did the reformers get this idea from? That salvation was by faith alone in Jesus Christ. By, by laying hold of the fact that he died on a cross, rose again, that gave us eternal life. Believing in that. What gave them this idea, this revolutionary idea, that it was by faith in what God had done and not by what we have done? It wasn't Catholic tradition. It was what they called sola scriptura. Only the scriptures. Martin Luther got in the Bible. He got in here. And he said, it's not what God says. It's not what, he's, it's not what he teaches. Today, we don't really think about stating that statement. Bible only. You all believe Bible only for authority? Infallible authority. There's a couple of you that do. Right? We all do, right? Absolutely infallible authority right here, correct? We don't think much about making that kind of a statement, but in the 1500s, that was a revolutionary idea. And that's what we need today. Believe it or not, in the church today, we need men and women who will stand up and say, this and this alone is authority. Infallible authority. Nothing else. This plus nothing else, this by itself. That is authority. Because I believe if this was absolute authority and we were knowledgeable of this, we'd be a lot farther down the road of restoration, right? So let's today, you and I, let's rededicate ourselves to this reality that only Scripture is infallible truth. That the restoration of those who returned, these exiles, the understanding that their work wasn't finished. When Zerubbabel took those exiles in that first wave to Jerusalem, they built the altar, they relayed the foundation of the temple. Fifteen years later, they finished and built the temple, and that's all glorious. But Zerubbabel didn't finish the work. Neither, neither did those who were with him. It was the beginning stage of the work of restoration. The second wave wouldn't come for 80 years. 80 years after that, another wave came. And God sent Ezra. And Ezra, I believe, is the key for us knowing at what stage of the restoration we are living in today. There's been a pretty big gap from the time the Reformers started their work till today. And that was the same with that first and second wave of restoration. Zerubbabel went 80 years before uh, Ezra. But from the time of Ezra to the time of Nehemiah was only 13 years. You see where I'm getting at? We're in the growing season, folks. We're in the time of working in the field. That field work started a long time ago. Yet we're still in between. The harvest hasn't come yet. The trumpet hasn't sounded. We're somewhere in between there. Now, I believe we're way down on this end of it. Where are we at? I believe that the day that we're living in, we're in the time of Ezra. And we're going to talk about that next week, about this man Ezra and what he accomplished, what he was able to do, what he was not able to do, because that should encourage us in the work that we're doing. We can learn from him what we are able to do, what we should be doing, and what we're not going to be able to do. Because as much as I want it to happen, it ain't Art Cox's work. It's God's work. But that's not to... Uh, to discourage you in saying we're not going to be able to complete the work. 
It's just to remind you that God's going to complete the work, right? Nehemiah is a picture in this sequence that I want to put forth of the Messiah's kingdom coming and bringing that work to its full completion. The work Zerubbabel did, absolutely important. Ezra, absolutely critical. Nehemiah, the completion of the restoration that would be completed under God's timing and under his ways. Okay, and that's where we'll go next week. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Pray that you'd be with us, lead us, and guide us. Pray that you give us a victorious week, Lord. Give us opportunity to speak to people. Give us opportunity to reach out to the lost. Reach out to our brothers and sisters in the faith. Give us, give us patience, Lord. Give us, uh, give us understanding that we were in their shoes at one time, Lord. We, somebody may have said something to us, and we said, well, we don't see that, but uh, bless you, brother. Help us to be patient, Lord, speaking to our friends, our families, our loved ones, to the strangers. Thank you for your goodness. Again, pray for those who aren't here today, those who aren't feeling well, that you give them full recovery. We ask in Yeshua's name. Amen.